if I told you that I could take you in the room next door and show you God, what would you do? I'm still in my la la land of this is a guru. I can't teach many people. I think I might be able to teach you. One of the first things he said to me is that yoga is a technique created for men to be able to make love to women for a very long time. And I'm like, sex? With whom? He gave me confidence by saying we had been married in a past life. That's why the age difference was so big. He's like, they're here, I'm pulling this blood out of the air, and he puts his finger right here at the third eye, like smears it with blood. I'm assuming he had cut his finger. You are now sealed with us, nothing will separate us again. Whoa. We ended up opening a yoga center that in, that existed for 10 years, ended up training other people who would then open their own yoga centers. Doesn't cross my mind that I'm being duped, that I'm being royally duped for 18 years by a guy who's trying to make money for his family. I felt like my identity had been erased. My mom felt fear on my behalf. She says, you were unreachable. I thought he was gonna kill you. Oh my gosh. But what she then reasoned to herself, she said is he wouldn't kill his golden goose. Hey, my name is Shalise Ansola, and this is Cults to Consciousness, where we discuss leaving high-demand religions or organizations and finding healing and independence through awareness and true individual sovereignty. If you're only listening and you want to see our faces, you can go to our YouTube channel at Cults to Consciousness, where you can like, subscribe, it boosts the algorithm, it makes our guests feel loved and supported. Remember, they do read the comments, so those words of encouragement mean a lot. Today's guest, we came across her after we did a little bit of polling, a little audience polling looking for people who are caught up in new age cults. So anything that is not on really the Christian religious side, but something that's a little bit more esoteric, I guess you could say. And we found her because she was part of a yoga group who the, well, I guess you could call him a cult leader, was very problematic, this yogi. And she wrote a whole book about it. And I want to make sure I get the name right. The Secret Practice, 18 Years on the Dark Side of Yoga. I was able to read some of it before we recorded. I wish I could have read all of it first, but it's really great. Highly recommend you guys go read this after this interview. And this is also a little bit of a disclaimer before we start that we are not saying that everyone who practices yoga is in a cult or that all yoga is cult-like. But we do want to call attention to those people, those leaders, those yogis who are using yoga to manipulate the groups that they are forming. And we do think it's a really important thing to talk about. So without further ado, thank you so much for joining us, Joelle Tamras. Hi, Shalise. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Daniela actually recommended us to you, Daniela Mesonek Young, child from the Children of God. We've done a few episodes with her. She's awesome. And I was like, anyone that Daniela recommends is going to be great. And I'm already so excited to get into this with you. Thank you so much, Shalise. And thank you, Daniela. If you're listening, uh, yeah, Daniela Mesonek Young's book is amazing. And yes. uh, I got to know her through her book. And then she got to know me through my book and really shed a very useful and knowledgeable cult lens in my experience. Yeah, Daniela has some incredible insight. And also, you are a graduate of Harvard as well, right? That's right. I uh, graduated from Harvard undergrad. I did a BA, honors BA degree in social studies, which included psychology, economics, and anthropology. And that's how I got to India in the first place. Yeah, and that's so important to talk about because this was before you joined uh, you joined forces with this guru, right? So you were highly educated, you had a great head on your shoulders, and this man was able to still get into your brain. I think it's important that people understand that it's never about intelligence, that very smart people can get roped into things. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I was an independent thinker at, at university and, you know, I did well there. But when I met him, Shalise, I was at a crossroads. I just graduated. And I had been exposed mm -hmm. to what you described to the viewers as new age esoteric thinking through transcendental meditation, which I'd learned at the age of 18. Mm -hmm. And that's where I became really seeped into the whole world of meditation and quite esoteric meditations. Because if people don't know um, transcendental meditation is also called TM, so we're just going to call it TM for short. And even though it's kind of sold as a vanilla type of meditation, it's really not. You know, there's very bespoke mantras that are given. 
And then I had even learned yogic flying at the age of 20. So that's a bit odd as well. So I had been exposed to what I can now call more magical thinking type practices where you're told mm-hmm. something and then you're performing something. And it's it's quite incredible after the fact when you realize what, what you were doing. Interesting. Can you tell everyone what flying yoga is for me as well? Because I don't know. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So and I actually looked up recently, does the TM movement still teach what they call yoga flying? And it seems like they do. It, the format has probably changed a bit. But this is back. So I graduated um, from Harvard in 95. And I learned this technique about 93. I became part I got a card at the end of learning this I am now I, I mean, I, I disowned it, but I have a card of the age. I am a member of the Age of Enlightenment. It's a green plastic card with my picture on it, which I got after a two-week program where you're essentially taught to repeat these um, sutras, which are short phrases uh, that uh, exist in an ancient text called the Patanjali Yoga Sutras, very, very well known in the yoga community. And Patanjali, there's this one chapter called Yogic Powers. And it's a chapter that people hardly ever talk about in yoga classes. They'll quote this book all the time as the foundation of yoga, but they never talk about, I think it's chapter three on the powers. And one of the powers is to make your body as light as cotton. And there's other powers like make your body as tiny as a thumb or as large as the universe. It's all these kinds of extreme powers that can be gained through the concentration of yoga. So, the yogic flying was basically we were taught to repeat light as cotton or something like that and um, hop off this cushion mat. Yeah, some people could do it out of a lotus position or cross-legged. Uh, I chose to kneel for easier to hop. But when I was learning it at the time, I remember thinking, how am I going to know? Like, how am I going to know when I know how to hop? And, you know, I was taught in a group of women. So one thing to note is that the TM movement separates women and men. You do not learn with men and you learn only with women. And essentially, as I saw other women perform this little hop off a mat, I thought, oh, I think as I concentrate, I said, I'm ready to in this kind of this group feeling and you just take a hop. Okay. So... I'd like to know from your perspective, was there any merit to this? And I say this with a completely open mind. Was there at at any point did you feel like you were light as cotton and you did hop off the mat? Or was it something that you were kind of tricking yourself into believing? I think at the time I felt like I was learning. I believed I was learning a higher order of meditation. So I really believed in the repetition of these sutras, these phrases, the last of which was light as cotton. So I thought, wow, what I'm doing is really powerful. But then the next summer, the summer of 94, was my first summer in India. I'd gone to do some research on social activism, so nothing about spirituality. And there I met a friend of my family. So I was interested. He said to me that he'd abandoned the TM movement and that these powers were never meant to be pursued. And that was interesting. That's all it took for me to relinquish these adva- this advanced training because he said that he had done years of yoga hopping. He damaged his knees. He was no longer part of the TM movement. He changed ashrams. Uh So there's this very large ashram, which is a religious community in Rishikesh, India, um, which is known as the home of yoga. And in Rishikesh, India, there is a Shivananda ashram. So he had left TM and joined Shivananda and said, you know, these repeating these powers is wrong. And when he said that, I thought, he's right. Why am I doing this? So sometimes it doesn't take a lot to wake you up, Mm -hmm. but it takes that that right statement at the right moment for you to really think through, um, why am I doing this? And I don't think this man had an agenda to get me to stop these meditations. He was just sharing his experience, essentially his testimony about why he'd left. Right. Um, But it resonated with me. Yeah, that's interesting that you were able to see that so clearly. And then when you met this other guy, this guru he was able to kind of sink his claws into you. And I imagine it's just because it was an overtime thing, a gradual thing. Do you want to talk about how you met him and what got you to sort of fall under his spell? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so so let's fast forward a year later. I've now graduated. I've gone back to India. I've received a travel grant from the university. It's given me 
a break to figure things out. And in my application, I said, I want to learn more about the religions of India, notably Hinduism. I mean, India is a huge multicultural society with a huge Muslim population. But I was going specifically to learn about the Hindu, you know, religious underpinnings. Mm -hmm. And I was traveling with a man that I'd met at the TM Center who I considered my spiritual superior. Mm -hmm. So he was 15 years older than me. We had dated in college and we were at the end of the, our relationship, but we still had traveled to India together. And when we first met the Swami Arun, the man I would, as you say, get completely wrapped into, uh, James was very taken in by him. He said, this man knows what he's doing. And Arun was portrayed himself as a Swami. So he's dressed in the orange colors of the religious Swami of India which is usually, ironically, a group of celibate men or swamis, okay. kind of like you would think of like a monastery group. Sure. Um, Arun was anything but he was, it was clear that he was interested in women um, and had, he already had a bunch of women around him, foreign women, some of Indian descent, but essentially foreign women gathered around him. So Essentially, we tuned into what he had to say, and he was quite subtle in saying that he knew of the secret yoga. I, I don't think he started by saying it was secret, by the way. I think it was more that he was saying that he knew this authentic yoga. But it was just inter interspersed here and there in the conversation with these women. It wasn't like he was over the top trying to be a guru. Yeah. But James went and had a private conversation with the room. So again, James is the man I was traveling with. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, I think Arun is the real thing. And we had had a couple of very bad encounters. So James and I were tra already traveling for a month before we met Arun. Mm. And we had some very bad encounters with um, gurus, particularly one. I say that because I think it made me more open to Arun, who was had lived many years in the U.S. And when I met him, he just seemed like this very nice guy. And he had this cultivated friendliness. He was warm. Although he was wearing orange, he was wearing like a flannel T-shirt and like um, short athletic shorts and like these sports shoes. So he, it was like this mixture of images. He had these like curls down to his shoulders and like um, quite a striking face that you couldn't immediately say where he was from. Mm -hmm. And I just was like, oh, he seems really nice. Like there's nothing wrong with him. Um and it, probably in my mind, I was comparing to the other way that gurus usually look, which is for me much more daunting. Mm -hmm. I, if you want, I can tell you about that. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So sh just a little bit before. So just to clarify, I was off to travel for four months from so about August to December. And it was agreed that James would be with me for the first month only. But before I set off to travel in my mom's building in New York City, I walk into the elevator and I see this guy uh, wearing these white robes with jet black hair and like a red dot in between <laughs> his eyes. And I just instinctively, because I know a bit about Indian culture at this point from TM, I put my hands together and namaste and he namastes back. And in the time it takes to go up in the elevator, he's invited me up to where he's staying. Oh, uh, with these people that I happen to know who these people are because my parents knew them. So I like thought, oh, wow, this is really cool. So I go up to this apartment and I knock on the door and I'm introduced to this guy called Chandra Swami. Chandra means moon, but that's irrelevant. Chandra Swami. And he just says, you know, oh, and I don't tell him that I'm going to be traveling to India. And he's like, oh, I live in Delhi. Come to my ashram. Here's my address. I'm going to teach you this yoga, essentially, that you won't learn anywhere else. I didn't feel super comfortable, but I thought, OK, you know, maybe. <laughs> and he um, before I leave, he's like, think of a flower. So I thought in my mind without saying it, rose. And he's like, rose. Like, right. Whoa. And then he's like, think of a number. So I. I hold in my mind the number seven and he's like seven oh. and I'm like Shalice you would think this I'd be sold but I wasn't really so this is the funny part I did have a critical because I'm like I'm not into magic like I don't know how <laughs> you did that but that's not yoga yeah I'm trying to connect with the divine power of the universe and you're guessing the number seven yeah so like, we're not on the same way <laughs> so it didn't it was weird like he clearly did it to gain influence. And I, I thought it was weird, but it almost put me off a little bit. 
because mm -hmm. I, that's not what I was going for. Anyway, fast forward a little bit. We're in Delhi. We've just arrived. I'm at the start of this, you know, project. I don't really know where I'm going to be learning these religious teachings. I mean, I've got a few addresses, but I don't have like an absolute set path. So I, we, we, James and I go to this Chandra Swami. I, I call him up and he says, come to my ashram. And to me, an ashram is a pretty austere place. And when we get to this Chandra Swami, I, it doesn't match at all. There's this, it's this gated, it's this super luxurious mansion. It's gated and there's armed guards at the gate. Mm. And I'm thinking, what the heck is going on? But I'm there. So I knock on the door and I'm brought in with James. Um, Chandra Swami is sitting on a platform. So raised above us, there's a horseshoe set up of seats and a couple of guys are there clearly, you know, below him and he's used to being worshipped. And he looks at me and he's like, OK, we're going to have two rooms for you guys. And I'm like, no, we're sharing a room. And he's about to be like, you're not allowed to do that. And I'm going, there is no way I'm staying here in my own room. Yeah. Like, there's just no way I'm scared. Like, you know. Anyway, he somehow agrees. You can see this wasn't his plan that I'd arrive with the guy. Yeah. <laughs> we have a room together. And later that that day, I'm summoned to meet Chandra Swami on my own. James is not part of this. He's not invited to be taught or anything. <laughs> he shows up. He's like in this. He's like in just in a towel. He's this fat guy glistening with oil. He's just had his daily massage because, of course, he's massaged daily by someone. And he sits. So I'm, he's like, I'm like, OK, well, if you want to receive me in this. I, I'm still in my la la land of this is a guru. So he sits down and he's like, my yoga has three parts. Mantra, yantra and tantra. Mm. Now, I knew what those words meant, but he quickly cut to the chase. He's like. Mantra is sound. Yantra is an image. It's like a divine geometrical shape, I guess, that you could meditate upon. And Tantra is sex. And like my jaw dropped. And I'm like, sex? He's like, yep. Yeah. I'm going, with whom? Yeah. <laughs> He's like, with men of my choice. Oh, okay. Not even with him. Like me. And then he adds, like me, for instance. Ah, there it is. <laughs> I just felt like a complete idiot, but I was also seized with fear. I said, Joel, you were the stupidest person in my mind that how could you fall for this? But I was also very frightened. I think because of the armed guards and the setup and mm -hmm. just the way these guys talk and the kind of authority they exert, everyone's subservient to them. Mm -hmm. Everyone's catering to their needs. So I didn't want to let on that I was scared or, and this was an absolute no go. Mm -hmm. So I just kept quiet and I, I said as little as possible. I used the kind of like, mm, mm. <laughs> and then um, he just said, okay, well, join me on a morning walk tomorrow. So I was like, okay, fine. So we went back, you know, I went back to the room I was sharing with James and I was like, thank God I insisted on sharing a room because I didn't want anyone to open my door. And yeah, I was petrified. I just did not sleep a wink. I just said, okay, we're going to go on this walk. And after the walk, we just leave. Mm -hmm. And that's what we did. And I just, I got to it. So we, we were able to leave. We had our bags packed, everything ready. We left the mansion we found a taxi not far <laughs> along the road, got in. It's about a five-hour drive to Rishikesh from Delhi. Thankfully, I was praying. I was like, please take us. And the the taxi driver, I was like, will you go to Rishikesh? He would. It's, you know, 150 miles, but he took us. Whoa. And for a while there, when we first arrived, I was having nightmares that Chandra Swami had found me. I mean, that's how shocked I was by by the con. And I will just finish the story by saying that one or two years later, but not long after he was arrested, I did not know this guy was tied into the senior most echelons of Indian politicians and economic circles. Like he was seriously well connected, Chandra Swami. And I'm not sure it was just with him. He was picking up girls for who knows for whom. Mm -hmm. Um, and I said, I told the story back to Arun. I know it feels like we've gone far, but it ties back because I trusted Arun from the get go. I felt like the way he spoke American English, 
you know, with like a light accent, but he was using vernacular. He was using language that felt familiar. Mm -hmm. And he was, this is Arun, and he was, I felt like it was like an, an uncle type relationship when we first met. He was just like, but there was a sexual innuendos right from the get go. He was clearly surrounded by women and, you know, he was muscular and built and there was this sense of, I don't know, he was like attracting women as well. So it was, it was murky from the beginning, but I knew he was 55. I was 22. I, that wasn't my plan in life. I was going to marry a 55 year old. <laughs> yeah. So you're immediately taken by him and you say that there's this these sexual innuendos coming from him and you're attracted in some way. Did you feel any sort of sexual chemistry or was that completely off the table? You mentioned you felt like an uncle, but I'm wondering if there was any part of you that wanted to be in a sexual relationship with him right off the bat or if that's something that he kind of groomed you into. Yeah, I, I think he grew me. I think he played both. No, I, I did find him attractive, but a part of me was like, it can't be. Yeah. Like there's, it's a weird feeling where like, I don't think I thought about him that way immediately. You know, it, it definitely grew me into it and cultivated that, that initial feeling. Yeah. And I guess this is major spoiler alert. You did end up marrying him. So for the audience who's unaware, it worked. So I'm wondering then, because he had so many women around him, he kind of singled in on you. Do you have any suspicion as to why, obviously, besides you're beautiful and awesome? <laughs> <laughs> but do you know, because we know who he was and like what his con was, looking back, why do you think he singled in on you specifically? No, I think I think you're, I think it had nothing to do with <laughs> with who I was intrinsically. Though that's kind of usually. I think he was. Um, I think there were a few things. I was young. I was vulnerable. I was susceptible to what he had to say. So I think the more he could find a victim who was interested in the spiritual knowledge that he was peddling, the more he could hook into them. Mm -hmm. Also, someone who wouldn't detect the con right. for as long as possible. I think he was probably trying it on with several women. You know, it's not clear that I was the only one he went after. So of the women that were there, I got to know them because it became a regular thing. And because when James met him, James left soon thereafter. And I think James also gave him a clue as to how much we were steeped in the spiritual tradition because James had told him we had come to meet the mythical yogi Babaji. Mm hmm which is, uh, you know, for for viewers and yourself who may not know, he's supposed to be like the master yogi, according to one of the earliest um, yoga biographies that was sold in the West, Autobiography of a Yogi by Paramahansa Yogananda, that talks about Baba G is never called anything else, really. And that just means father. And G is just a respectful thing you can add at the end of any name in Hindi. So Baba G, father, respected father is supposed to have lived 800 years and have always looked like a young man and be, you know, this, again, this mythical yogi who has used the knowledge to live in perpetual youth, never even marrying or any of that. But anyway, James was very enamored with the figure of Babaji. And I was too. Once James introduced me, I thought, wow, this is the ideal of, of our tradition that I'd espoused. You know, now that I'd espoused these Eastern, esoteric, New Age, whatever you want to call them. I've also heard the word Neo-Hindu, whatever we want to call it. Um, this Babaji was someone to follow. So James had told Arun about uh, this quest, this failed quest. <laughs> and, and this is significant. It comes up later, this Babaji figure um, in Arun's con. But at the time, he, uh, you know, he had just heard this news. So he's like, these guys are really into this stuff, I'm thinking. They're going to be, you know, good victims. But there was this other group of a couple of French women, not because I was the youngest in the group of following Arun at 22. I think they must. I don't know how old they were. They were maybe in their 30s, maybe older, maybe early 40s. They were also very interested in him. And one of them was very um, directly flirting with Arun. She was a bit sassier. She was like just playing with it. And he was playing off these women off of each other, including me. And at one point he said that Chantal, this sassy French woman had said, 
oh, get this young woman away from you. She's in love with you. And he said, he took me in his confidence and said, can you believe she said this about you? And I'm like, oh, <sighs> how can she say this about us? At this point, I was a student. We're in a pure relationship. It's sacred. Yeah. When I started learning yoga from him, um, you know, as you said, as you honed in, there might have been this initial attraction, inappropriate attraction in my mind. But then when I started learning from him, I'm like, no, this is this. I'm a student now. You know, I, we can't be mixing other things. But he was playing the Chantal and he said that she'd spent the night. I mean, he was playing all these different characters. Mm. Uh, and I don't know what he got out of the other ones. It's possible that he got some travel money off of them, too. So do you think his main con was the financial side of things? I think it was financial and it was around having sex with younger women or available women, hopefully to extortion some money out of them, um, but also maybe to create some links. This is what comes later into the story when we are much more involved and he breaks open the marriage in a way that I find devastating. I don't think there was initial financial gain, so it was a long game. Mm. Or he was trying to create a harem. And maybe he, in his mind, he felt like if he got enough women who maybe were close to each other, but all beholden to him, that he could create something that would be hard to break. Yeah. I think he was aware in the back of his mind. I wasn't, of course. I was completely taken in. But he was aware in the back of his mind, Joelle might flip someday, you know, in her thinking. A bit like I'd done with the yogic flying. She, she might see through me. So I think he was very carefully playing how bad he was. In other words, what I mean by how bad is like he broke up with open the marriage and kind of gambled that I wouldn't leave him on that forced open marriage. But then when he asked to add other women and I said, no, he never tried to push that. So there was it's it's a con and it's a very complex game of manipulation that he played full time. Yeah, because you were married 20 years. We were married. So from that time I met him in India and started learning from him, we were long distance relationship for two years. He had a criminal record in the U.S. That was why he couldn't return to the U.S. Oh, what kind of criminal record? I learned this a year after meeting him. He was, had been accused of sexual crimes on minors. <sighs> He had had been sexually involved with, I think they were 15 year olds mm. in Napa, California. He brought me into his confidence a year into knowing him. By now, we're in a romantic relationship, still learning the yoga, still seeing him as my yoga master. But we're now also a unit. And so he says, look, before we go any further, another one of these, I got to tell you this. He's like, I have this is why I knew he couldn't go back to the U.S., but I trusted him. I said he will tell me. I think the worst thing I did all along was to ever trust him, but I gave him my trust. He said to me, you need to know this. This is what happened. And he went through, he didn't right away say about the record. He said what had happened, that he'd moved from LA to Napa, the whole story around why these 15 year olds that he didn't supposedly didn't know landed on his door. They didn't go to school that day. According to him, he let them in. And as soon as he said that, I knew the end of the story. I'm like, how could you let? 15 year olds into your house. You're a single man, almost 50. Yeah. Like no one does that. And he's like, it was a terrible mistake, but I was framed. And then what he said is he said a couple things to gain my pity. He said, um, I didn't do anything wrong. That's all he repeated. So very, you know, I didn't ever did anything wrong. And he said, once I got a lawyer, I didn't have enough money to hire a lawyer. So I got a state lawyer and the lawyer said with the white jury, they will not hear your side of the story. You're a brown man. You've got to plead guilty. And my heart went out to him. I said he made a terrible mistake and he was punished for it. And he said, I served my time. I've left. I lost my green card. I'm back in India, but I want to go back. And I think coming back to your earlier question, I think he was interested in me because I was American. Yeah. The other women were European. Maybe his first he knew that he'd been successful. He'd been very successful in L.A., according to him, as a massage therapist. 
I think he'd been popular. So he's like, I'm going to go back because this is what I do. And in the beginning, he tried to enlist my help to read his legal files and get him back. And I did consult a criminal lawyer. And they said that immigration law had changed in 96, that we were in terrible luck. And even though if he married a U.S. citizen, he his crimes were of an egregious nature mm -hmm. and he was barred from reentry. So we ended up going to France. I applied for an MBA program at his suggestion, also at my dad's suggestion. And uh, it was not in the cards, Shalise. I had at the time no interest in business, but it ended up being a good thing to get more education. Mm -hmm. So I applied for the MBA program. I got in and um, yeah, we ended up living in France. And you got married without your parents knowing. That's one thing I remember from your book is your mom was a little sad. Yeah. Like, why didn't you think you could tell me this? And so yeah. what were your parents' opinion of him? <sighs> My mom first met him shortly after we started the romantic relationship. She knew, see, I finished the first four months in India and I came home and I wasn't back a couple days when I said to her, mom, I'm going back. And she looks at me and she's like, but you're done with India. <laughs> and I'm like, no, no, I've met this great teacher. Now, I haven't told her that we've taken the teaching a little further. Yeah. I'm like, I've met this great teacher. I still need to learn. So she's OK. Well, she says, if you really insist on it, then when you do go back for this other stint of a few months, I'll come to visit you. So she'd come out to meet him in Delhi. This is the start of 96. And at first, she was also taken in by his charismatic spiritual persona. She, he ended up getting my mom to talk to him. My parents are divorced, and they had been divorced for quite a while then. And he ended up getting my mom to share personal problems with him and even to commit to paying him to get these special prayers on her behalf. Oh. So she didn't pay money up front, but she said, look, you write down your seven wishes and work and write them on pieces of paper and close up the page. You know, nobody gets to see these pieces of paper and I'm going to take them to the best priest, Hindu priest family. This family prays day and night. I mean, Hindu priests are, are men. So it's the male, you know, they, they pray day and night. They pray in Sanskrit. They're the real thing. And your prayers will be realized. And no sooner. And, but my mom was already suspicious of our setup in Delhi. Cause she's like, you're with this guy. I'm like, no, mom, I'm not because I'm not ready to tell her. So I'm lying to my mom. And she's like, but there's only one bed here. Yeah. And I was like, no, he sleeps in the living room. As soon as my mom had left, he told me that he opened all those prayers. And he said, do you want to know what she wrote there? And I was shocked. Yeah. I was doubly shocked. I, I was like, you said that the prayers could only come true if they were kept secret and left to the priests. Number one. Number two. That's not for me to know. Yeah. There were these red flags and I resist. I'm like, no, I don't want to know my mom's prayers. Like, I be if she believes you that you know this family, that these prayers are going to be realized. Anyway, when I get back to New York, I lived in New York City, you know, with my mom then, he starts to love bomb me. So now we haven't even known each other almost a year. He sends me the most, the longest letters. I don't think I matched you know, his words, it was all about how he'd been so lonely, he'd never met anyone. And though he was older, that I had filled, you know, a hole in his life. And by the way, why I started um, the romantic relationship with him, he gave me confidence by saying we had been married in a past life. Mm. And that's why the age difference was so big. We couldn't control when we would meet again. So he made it into this incredible um, miracle that we had been in the same place at the same time. And he said, I knew I was told to go find you that day. That very first day you saw me, I came for you. And I felt like loved and all this, you know, attention and that it was meant to be. And he's like, my elders, my spiritual teachers, they told me you were there. And I was like, oh, my goodness, like it's all meant to be. Mm -hmm. So he starts to write me these letters to cultivate the long distance relationship. And he's like, the elders are so proud of you. You're doing so well in your meditations. You're correcting the imbalance of the world. Like you're doing all this good. And I'm like, oh, it's all coming together. I'm, I'm finding love. I'm finding a spiritual mission. Like all these things I didn't know about, it's coming together for me. He's like, go work with your dad. I'm like working with my dad. <laughs> It all feels 
so right. But my mom, one day, so these letters were sent by fax. It was like, we just got onto email. (laughs) You're probably probably too young, Shalise, to know what a fax is. Oh, I've I've sent a fax before. (laughs) (laughs) Fax machines were making us, you know, this whining sound when the fax machine was in my mom's room. My sister and I slept ne- in the room next door, and I could hear it one evening, like, making the whining sounds. I run into her room, and all these spay- pages of, like, phone outs, I'm gathering them up from the floor. And my sister was there. She was in the room. She was working at my mom's computer. She was she had just started high school. I think she was 14. And my mom just stops me in my tracks because I want to get these pages and read them, go read them in my room. And she's like, Stop. And I'm like, oh, oh. <laughs> she like sit down. She was wearing her reading glasses. She puts her reading glasses on her head and she looks right into my eyes. And she's like, this is not a relationship between a teacher and student. And I'm a terrible liar. <laughs> she's like, what's going on, Joe or whatever? She, you know, my mom calls me and I'm like, we're together. And she just says, I can't believe it. He's old enough to be your grandfather. Ooh. And I just storm out of the room. I'm completely shamed. Um, and I'm like, why did you say grandfather? He's only dad's age, you know? And I'm like, so she was dead against him mm-hmm. from then on. He wove that narrative into saying that your mom fell in love with me. <gasps> and that's why she's against us being together. Mm. And he had specifically said to me, do not tell her about us until she pays for her prayers. Oh, he had asked for seven thousand dollars for those prayers. Seven thousand dollars for a make a wish. Not type of a thing. small sum. Jeez. Seven wishes, seven thousand. These are the were the best of the best. Um, you know that's what he said. My mom says she never agreed to pay that money. Now this shocked me. When he comes to ask her for money, he asks for eleven thousand dollars, and she says to him. She doesn't want to hear any more word out of his mouth. And she's like, I'm never paying you a dime. And by then she's dead against it. You know, for her, it was overwhelming. Um, He's very charismatic. So she, you know, she just was like this. And the only thing she said to me is you got to leave that. If you're going to stay with him, you leave this house. You could not leave, live here and be with him. And she just said one thing. She said, all he cares about is sex and money. Yeah. So did you find did you find that he was purposely trying to turn you against your family members so that you would abandon them and go be with him? Oh yeah. I think anyone who stood up against him, he found a reason for me to alienate from, back away. Yeah, back away and uh, one of the saving graces is that my mom's and I relationship despite these, you know, volatile moments was strong. Mm-hmm. She never let me go. That's why, you know, she's the first dedication in the book. Because what she did is, even though she was dead against him, she saw her daughter follow this man and she was not abandoning me. So she called once a week, no matter where I lived. Mm. We always talked once a week. She always checked in on me. When we lived in Europe, eventually she did come out and visit us. Um, she kind of, I w- she never liked him, but she put up with him. To see me. Yeah. And what he couldn't break, he just kind of also put up with. I mean, these guys are savvy. (laughs) I think, you know, but no, he definitely made sure that I was not taking her counsel. He played a funny game with my dad as well. My dad was ambiguous about his feelings towards him. My dad didn't come down hard. I think my dad, my dad, to be fair, and I were uh, distanced. We had a very strange relationship. He hadn't lived with us for many years. So perhaps my dad was afraid of losing me by coming out too strong. That's a generous view. Um, I think if my dad had come down strong, I think having another male authority figure being like, honey, this guy wants something else. I might have listened because my dad hardly ever gave me advice. Mm. My whole life, I felt like my dad was a friend. I did not grow up with a dad as an authority figure. Um, I will tell you one weird thing. My, they were the, well, it's in the book. It's in the first chapter. They were the exact same age. They were born in the same month. And I thought that Arun, one of the reasons I liked Arun was he was polar opposite to my dad. I thought Arun was a spiritual figure that his only purpose on earth was to fulfill the will of the elders and write 
wrongs here on earth through his meditations. And my dad, I just saw someone who was like pursuing money through deals. And, you know, I couldn't pin him down ever. Didn't really know what business he was in. He never really told us. So I was like, oh, my goodness. I'm with a completely different man. We're going to have this peaceful, calm life. And we, our life was crazy, Shalise. It was just like the most stressful thing. And all the time I thought it was me that something, well, I thought it was partly me that something I wasn't getting right. But I also thought that something we weren't doing right. Mm -hmm. I thought maybe living in Europe wasn't suiting him. And we needed to go back to India where I thought I had met this peaceful yogi. So, yeah, I was kind of living in my own dream world. Yeah. And it's so common. I want to point this out because people may be thinking who have never been in a high control group or under the authority of a high control figure, which is it can happen to anyone and it happens over time and things that you can look back now and say, clearly that was a con and why, what was I thinking? It's so not that simple when you're involved in it, when you're in the moment. And they just slowly start telling you things. They have explanations for everything. <laughs> they can manipulate anyone. The first time that you met him, when he was able to win over Trevor, I don't think that was an accident. I think he purposely won Trevor over so that Trevor James, would say he's a good guy. <laughs> J James? Oh, I'm sorry. Was it James yes. that was traveling with you? Yeah. Trevor's your now husband. We're not going to bring Trevor into <laughs> this. James. Trevor's like, he, 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 he hasn't won me over. No worries. I He's like, wait a second. Wait a second. Sorry, Trevor, I got you. We're going to take Trevor out of this. So I think he purposely is trying to win over those around you, especially your mom, so that you will have someone to validate. And that's that same thing has happened mm -hmm. to me before. So I just wanted to point that out for people who are like, how can someone fall for this? You know, it's so calculated. Everything is on purpose. There's no accidents. The language that they use, the way that they learn what's important to you, and then they go after that. They make you feel special, the love bombing. All of that is part of this master potion to put you under their spell. And so I wanted to talk more about him specifically because off camera we had mentioned some of the things he was claiming, some of his, quote, abilities that he would use to manipulate you. So let's just get a really good idea of who this character is. He starts off by presenting himself as the heir to this authentic yoga. So that speaks volumes to both James and me, as you said. I find myself doing something completely out of character one evening. I go up to his room at eight o'clock and I knock on his door totally out of character because I'm shy <laughs> normally. <laughs> and here I am knocking on his door. <laughs> he opens the door and he greets me like I'm a long lost friend and like he expected me to knock. Mm -hmm. So I walk in and his room, it just like the lights were on and he had like stuff in his room that I didn't have. So Rishikesh at the time was quite an austere place. So just to give our viewers and listeners an idea, um, alcohol is banned there, meat is banned there. Mm. At that time in India, there wasn't a lot of prop. Now with globalization, you can find many things everywhere. But at the time, there was only one kind of chocolate on the market, Cadbury's chocolate. Mm -hmm. And he had, I remember this milk chocolate bar and he had this bowl of cream and he had an apple and he had like a, an adventure book. And it just, it looked really like welcoming. And he just said, come sit down, chat. And we end up chatting and he tells me all about his life and how he had this amazing life in LA and what he used to do. And it just sounds so idyllic. So he pulls me into something that feels very safe. And then after he's done talking for a long time, I'm glued to his words because here I'm feeling like, wow, I'm a con I'm his confidant. Not for one thinking, why the heck am I the confidant of a 55 year old? Yeah. Anyway, I'm getting to hear the story. I feel privileged. And then he says, well, what about you? And I tell him a little bit about myself and he starts to say things that don't make as much sense. So he's like, oh, you're from New York City. I think I saw you there in the 80s. And I'm like, what? I'm like, what do you mean? Like, how would you recognize me from my childhood? Because in the 80s, I was a child. Anyway, so maybe he's picking up, as you said, my vibe that that didn't resonate. And then I said that my parents are from the Middle East. And he's like, oh, you should read the Quran. And I'm like, I'm not Muslim. And he's like, oh, read the Bible then. Hmm. So do you see how quickly they co-change? Yeah. And I'm like, 
because everybody should read their whole, everybody should know their holy book. I'm like, okay, that never came up again, but that first night you should go read the Bible. And then he's like, God, God, people talk about God all the time. But if I told you that I could take you in the room next door and show you God, what would you do? I just fell for that kind of language. I was like, I don't know. And he's like, yeah, it doesn't matter if I show you God. It's how you live your life. But that resonated with me. Like, I wasn't ready to see God. I actually believed he might be able to reveal God. That's how mesmerized I was by his words. And he said, I'll tell you what, I think I might be able to teach you. I can't teach many people, basically handpicked, but I might be able to teach you. Come back tomorrow at five in the morning. And that's where it started. And I go there at five and that's where he starts the teaching. And he uses his words very carefully. He uses a special tone of voice when he wants to be in that spiritual space. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking this is the real thing. And he says, I, um, my yoga is secret. I cannot teach it publicly. I teach only one student at a time. And it's come from my masters who were Chinese. So immediately he changes things a little bit. Like maybe if they were Indian, I could look them up. They're Chinese. They lived at the border of India and China. Now, there are three countries that border. It could have been Tibet. It could have been Nepal. Heck, it could have been India. He never said exactly where. I grew up in a cave. And this is where I learned what I know. And I'll just do a little bit of a, just a fast a few weeks into that. After I've paid to learn, he then says the thing that changes everything for me. He sits me down one day and again, in a very serious voice, he said, my master is Babaji. My jaw dropped. I was like, the Babaji? And he's like, yeah. And for me, with the James and the autobiography of a yogi and the whole thing that I was into Babaji, I just could not. And I know. A part of me just doubted. I was like, wait, you look, you, Babaji. <laughs> but, and then from then on, it just, he kept up this, this myth that he was the sole heir to Babaji's sacred knowledge. Wow. And that he was a special human being here on earth with a mission, beholden to the elders. Super important. So Babaji presided over eight elders. I mean, the complexity of the story, if you look at this, the machinations, he had eight elders. Arun would either speak with the elders or once in a blue moon, Babaji would, Babaji was unreachable at this point. He definitely wasn't on earth. He'd left earth, but he was almost unreachable on the other side too. That's what he called it, the other side. When I travel to the other side, that's what he'd call it. Anytime he slept, I'm traveling to the, I don't sleep. I travel to the other side. So that he that was the mission, and I was, I'm, I don't want to say embarrassed, but I'm like, it, I, I, that just, I think I was very needy of whatever he was saying, and it just, um, it resonated. Yeah, you, you were willing to accept it because of the exposure that you had previously, and because of the place that you were in, and because you trusted him and you revered him. I think it makes sense. I mean, honestly, if you look at any religions that we talk about on this podcast, they all have outlandish stories that people believe. So before mm -hmm. viewers, before you judge, remember some of the stories that maybe you may, may have believed <laughs> growing up or whatever it is. I certainly believe some wild stuff in Mormonism. So I don't think it's that far of a reach to really understand how easy it is to believe in a story that feels right based on the programming based on where you're at in your life. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the element of trust is huge. Mm -hmm. He always, as I said, he interwove the sexuality into his teachings, but in a very measured way. One of the first things he said to me is that yoga is a technique created for men to be able to make love to women for a very long time. Really? How on earth I was now a female student that now needed to have this knowledge. I don't know. And how millions and millions of women. But yeah, he said the original yoga was for men. Without using such explicit terms, he was saying to hold an erection for a long time. Mm -hmm. And but it's been it has other health benefits. So let's generalize it. But do you see how it was woven in without saying I'm holding <laughs> I can hold an erection for a long time. It's like woven in. 
And he's like, we revere women in yoga. Women are our goddesses. He once said to me, there is only one God on earth that I know of, or one, it's the woman. Why? Because she gives birth to children. She creates life. She's the goddess. There's no other God. And that would make any woman feel great and beautiful and valued. And respected. It felt like he must respect women so much. If he thinks we're goddesses for creating life, then he will not hurt women. He also said, when I revealed to him what had happened with the Chandra Swami, and by the way, he knew more. He read the paper every day, the newspaper. He always needed one to be on top of general world news. Um, and so he said, but Chandra Swami has known connections to the, you know, what I said to the Indian political circles. I didn't know because I hadn't looked him up, you know, uh, <laughs> it's kind of pre-internet days. <laughs> um, but when he heard the story, the other thing, Shalise, says he made me feel heard because he said, oh, my goodness, I hate men like that. And if there is one thing I will not tolerate as a man who hurts women or children, mm. I will fight with a man. He didn't say I would kill such a man, but he was. I mean, that's and so I thought, oh, what? how honorable. And then come to find out he's starting to do some of the same shenanigans. Do you want to go there? Is that part of the story? The part where we've opened the yoga center? Well, I guess we should mention how he claimed to channel people or how he was a walk in into his body and left his past behind. I think maybe we should start there. That's probably important context before we get to the next part. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> I like that walk. And I, yeah, so another thing that was really outlandish. Now, if the readers were, uh, not readers, <laughs> uh, listeners and viewers were surprised, uh, this story kind of tops them all. <laughs> I've, been, <laughs> I've been learning from him at this point for a couple of months daily. So you need to understand we're having daily interactions, about an hour a day. He's weaving in. He's t teaching me these breathing exercises, these physical movements. It all seems kind of above board, but we are. But he's always mixing in facts about himself, you know, what he was up to, that he'd had tons of women in L.A. And even at some point, the elder said, you've got to stop. This is not right. But, you know, he kind of put it down to like my youthful follies, uh -huh. you know, but like always playing on that, the bad and the good. Like I've been bad, but I'm reformed. I had too much of the sex stuff. Now I've had none, you know, for I don't know how, like all of it was, you know, especially I've had none was, <laughs> we, we don't believe that. <laughs> so um, be before we set off to travel together, at this point, I'm, I'm very much into his narrative and I'm assuming we're going to travel together as a couple. Now, India, especially back then, this is now 30 years ago, very traditional society and, you know, he's like, we can't travel as an unmarried couple, just you and me, but I'm, there's these other friends, they're in the book too, you know, they're going to travel with us. The one guy, Surat, ends up being an important, you know, character in the book, but that's a separate point. So before we all travel together, one night he's like, before we, you know, more, you need to find out, I need to tell you something very personal. And he says, I've been alive for 180 years. And, you know, you hear these words that are nonsensical. They're coming out of someone that you think has the supreme or, you know, very valuable spiritual knowledge. And I didn't know how to take them. So I just said in the same body. Right. Like, is that body 180 years old? It doesn't look on. It's like, <laughs> look, looks pretty good. <laughs> and then he's like, no, I lost my original body and I took over Arun's body. So now I'm like, well, what's your name? It, it, it's it's, it's mind boggling. But he's like, Arun. When I took over his body, he was a very sick man and I just pushed him out. And I came in and Arun had, was married. He had a wife and five kids. So this is his introduction to the fact that he's got a wife and five kids. And you're married at this point. Not yet. Okay. No, okay. no we were not married yet. Yeah, we were not married yet. This was early on. We were not even romantically involved. Okay. But at this point, this Indian family, um, I, I don't know. I'm not taking this in. Is, But he just seems to elicit pity and care when he tells you these stories. So he's telling me it's a terrible thing I did. I, you know, yes, the man was going to die, but I, you know, dealt the final stroke and I took over the body. And now I'm indebted to his wife and kids mm. because he, I've, I've created a widow and kids. So he's basically calling his wife a widow <laughs> 
And I'm just thinking, what is going on? And my feeling at that moment is, this man needs me, which I know is a very weird thing, but I just felt very sad at that moment. But it, it, it came and went. So I, I remember lying in bed that I had you know, my own hotel room, I lay in bed and I was like, I was like, what is going on? What is this guy's story and this family that he has to take care of? And the amazing thing is, it doesn't cross my mind that I'm being duped, that I'm being royally duped by a guy who's trying to make money for his family. Right. <gasps> I'm totally in this. Right. So I'm not. Um, we do become romantically involved. Before we're married, I meet one of the daughters. She welcomes me in. She will. And I'm going. She's a little bit older than me. Um, I don't think any of his kids were as young as I think his youngest daughter who lived abroad was probably a couple years older. So if I was 22 at the time, she might have been 24. Maybe the one I'm meeting is 26. I mean, he, you know, so she's not much older. Um, she calls him dad. And she's like, yeah, the family don't know that I've taken over their dad's body, but they have an inkling. And he's like, the wife knows the wife kicked me out of the house. Oh my god. Cuz she's like you ain't my husband. I guess I'm I hmm. wanted to illustrate how easy it is for these masterminds to manipulate the story to tell you one thing to make everything else that will probably happen in the future make sense. So if you were to ever meet his ex-wife, she would say all of these things that would somewhat line up with his version of the story to make you be like, oh, well, no wonder she's bitter because that's not her husband. You know, <laughs> like the way that he's able to manipulate the story is uh, unfortunately brilliant in the fact that like, yeah, the kids don't know. So why would you bring it up to them? Why would like you would never say to them, oh, yeah, he's not really your dad blah, 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 because he's telling you they don't know about it and you don't want to be the one to tell them. It's just it's too much. <laughs> it's too much. It's mind boggling. And so I'm meeting her. So and you know what the weird thing is? So when I first lived with him in Delhi, when we got romantically involved, there were a couple of days before, or maybe five days before I went back to New York. And when I made that fateful decision, when I spoke to my mom and said, I'm going back, I haven't finished learning. So when we first lived together, it's my first time living with a man. Like, I'm kind of like, ooh, you know, there's a lot going on in my mind. I haven't lived with someone before. Um, I'm enamored with him. I'm enthralled with him. I'm embarrassed to say I'm worshiping <laughs> him. And so I walk in, I'm full of, you know, like eagerness. And um, I'm in my first also very romantic sexual relationship. I mean, I wasn't, I, not that I'd never been with someone, but it was much more uh, evolved. Like we were much more together, like because we were living together. Then I start to pick up weird vibes. Like one day I say, so it takes like two weeks for me to like really be comfortable with him. And he's like, oh, you finally opened up to me. He means sexually. And I'm like, didn't know I hadn't. Like, I all of a sudden I'm like, oh, like I'm kind of being observed here. Uh, so I'm, I'm illustrating this to just say how young I was, naive, inexperienced, but like ready to, <laughs> to live this great life. Mm -hmm. And then one day I'm doing my meditation and this thought crosses my mind. And I'm like, why did he teach me and not James? Because mm -hmm. in my mind, I'm still figuring, I'm still in the spiritual hierarchy which is a huge fallacy, but a great way that people get taken in. Because if I can tell you I'm more spiritual than you, you're going to listen to me. Yeah. I'm thinking, wait, James knew so much about yoga, so much more than me, way more. And also James is a lot older than me, 15 years older. So I, I say to Arun very innocently, I say, hey, um, you know, when you met us both, why did you choose me and not James? He loses it. His face changes into a complete, like, irate monster face. He's Ooh. like, oh, how could you even doubt me? I've made a terrible mistake. Like, how could you ask that? And all of a sudden, I lock into his mood. And I'm like, you are such an idiot. He told you you're special. He told you you're the one. Why are you talking about James? And I, he, he storms out of the room because I've been like, you know, we have this conversation in the bedroom. He storms out, goes to the living room. 
I crumple onto the bed and I feel devastated. Mm -hmm. I feel kind of thrown back. Some of the times I felt abandoned as a child, I really feel like a child. I feel like I've been chastised Mm -hmm. in a very harsh way and I feel terrible and I feel like I've lost everything that I built up. He kind of leaves me to wallow in that state of extreme anguish for about, I don't know, 10 minutes. (laughs) I'm having a splitting headache. I think I can't make it. He comes back in. He's like, I'm sorry. The elders told me not to speak to you like that. And he holds out his hand. He pulls me up. He takes me out. into like he holds, He's like, come with me. We go to the living room. And he's like, the elders have reprimanded me. I was much too harsh. I'm really sorry. And he, he, I'm assuming he had cut his finger. He kind of rubs his, his thumb and forefinger together. And he's like, and there's blood. And he's like, the blood of the elders. He's like, he's like, they're here. I'm pulling this blood out of the air. And he puts his finger right here at the third eye and in you know, the mythical third eye. And he like, like smears it with blood. And he's like, you are now sealed with us. Nothing will separate us again. Whoa. Okay. Looking back at that experience now, what is your perspective? From my perspective, it seems like he lost his cool and then was like, wait, I need to use this as a manipulation tactic to make sure she's okay with it. She's okay. Like, that's something that cult leaders do is they call out their bad behavior in a way that makes you feel pity for them, just like he did with all of his other stories that he's telling you is like, he's the victim, even though he's clearly the one who did something wrong. Shalise, I think it's all very calculated. I think that comment about James was, you know, my cognitive functioning, <laughs> clicking in there, Joel, hang on here. Yeah. It was a weird thing to say because we're like romantically involved and I'm supposed to be like top student and like all of a sudden I'm thinking about James. So he's probably thinking I've got to nip this in the bud. Right. But then the push and pull is that emotional manipulation because he will do that. That pattern will continue until he breaks open the marriage. Mm. But all the while where we're supposed to be this monogamous couple and I say supposed to be because I think, you know, I don't think that was ever real. (laughs) I mean, for one, there was at least the Indian wife, but whatever, (laughs) you know, they're not, they might've been split up, but while we were supposedly this monogamous couple, he had the push and pull all the time. And I would, was devastated when he would fight with me and the other manipulative tactic. And I know you wanted us to talk about the channeling. This will actually lead perfectly into it is that just before we moved to Europe at this point, I had already applied for the MBA. So the plan was set that we were going to do, we were going to move to France when I got into INSEAD, the MBA program. And he, I thought he was a teetotaler. So I was like, look, I don't drink. He had asked me before if I'd ever done cocaine for some reason that was important to him. And I was like, no, I haven't. But he's like, okay, good. Because if you had, I can't teach you. Interesting. Um, Like there were these random things. I know, I know. And then he had revealed, um, that he was a smoker of marijuana, you know, and I, and I said, I don't smoke marijuana. And he's like, oh, that's okay. Cause if you did, I'd have to stop. No, no, no. I smoke marijuana. You don't. It's not good when both people in the couple smoke because we're going to s- smoke too much. Like the, all the stuff they tell you, leave that with me. I need it for my practices, uh-huh. for my long meditations, for my traveling to the other side. I need the marijuana as an aid. You don't need that. I was like, good, good. (laughs) One less headache in this crazy life that I'm getting into. But the drinking, I I don't know why I I haven't traced back into my past. I was quite worried about a man who drinks heavily because I'm like, oh, you know, what is he going to do under the influence of alcohol? So he then, the, the last visit I ever have to Rishikesh before we move to Europe, he channels a spirit for the first time. Just when a crate of French wine is delivered in Rishikesh. And I know we said this quite a while ago in the episode, but we said that um, Rishikesh is alcohol free. It's one of those things. (laughs) So he has his crate delivered from the French embassy in India. Don't ask me how he, some connection. And I see this crate arrive and you know, a crate of wine is pretty unmistakable. (laughs) So I'm like, Arun, what's that? (laughs) What's that? So the crate gets put into the kitchen in this house. And all of a sudden, Arun places his hands on the kitchen counter and drops his head and like raises his head and changes his demeanor completely. I'd seen him play with his demeanor before, by the way, um, changes. And he's like, oh, Mother Joelle, 
how are you? And I know, because it fits the narrative that he's channeling someone. And I get, you know, instinctively stand back. He's like, don't worry. I'm Tao. I know you. You don't know me. I'm, I've come from the other side. And he said, oh, this, this, yeah. I need to tell you about this. He opens a bottle of wine. This is something he has to do for rituals. Okay. So what's going through your mind at this point? I'm shocked. I'm shocked that now the demeanor he puts on when he pretends to be a spirit is a much nicer demeanor than his normal demeanor. Oh, interesting. It's calm. It's collected. It's reasonable. I had um, a friend of mine, one of the people who read it, had an interesting take. She got very annoyed when Tao appears a spirit because she said Tao puts Joelle back in her box. Yeah. And Joelle goes back in her box and Tao is on very gentle, fatherly, reasonable. So he's trying to get over the fact that there's going to be drinking. There's going to be a lot of it. It's going to be ritualistic. I'm shocked. I'm a little bit worried. When Arun comes back, I'm like, are the elders still around? And he's like, no, 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 no. Like, they don't watch us when it's just you and me. And he said to Tao, explain to you. I'm like, yeah, so I, I'm I'm shocked. But what shocks me all though, because I don't know how much she's going to drink. I mean, I'm not, I didn't, you know, I didn't grow up under a rock. <laughs> I know people drink alcohol and not, it's not always a problem. It's not always excessive. So I don't think at this point I'm fully understanding what drink alcohol is going to mean. Mm -hmm. But we get to France and to INSEAD and he drinks up a storm. I mean, this man... <laughs> boom, becomes like a heavy drinker and with all sorts of behavioral issues to accompany it. Like I come back from my classes and I'm in this like very challenging program. I don't even know Excel and Microsoft Excel. I'm like out of my depth. <laughs> I'm one of the youngest students at the age of 24 there. And here he is. I get home and my, in my household, he's like tottering around. He's like very out of his, you know, normal behavior, just you know, squinting at me and he's having liqueur and you know, not just wine and beer. And I, that really, that floored me. And I, I, I didn't know what was going on there. But <laughs> last shocking comment, he said he was drinking because he had had to save my dad's life. My dad would have died if he hadn't started the ritual. How? How? Not to take too much of a tangent, but my dad had a complicated political and business life. Um, he did run for the Lebanese presidency in the 80s, and he was kidnapped at the time. Whoa. It had a very traumatic effect on the family. But fast forward, now we're talking about the 90s. And while I knew Arun before I started in Sayad, so about the March of the year before, I, <clears throat> the, before we moved in the September, my dad is um, held up in the Republic of Georgia in a prison. Irrespective of Arun, business associates are part of the way that he gets let go in three days. But when it happens, my mom is in complete shock. Even though they're divorced, she still knows the impact on her children. I have a sister and other siblings as well from another, uh, you know, woman and you know, my dad with another woman. And so, so my mom is still shocked by the news. And obviously I'm shocked. And so I say to her, do you want me to tell her room? She says, if you want to. So I call him up and like, this is what's happened. And Arun is like, do you want me to save your dad's life? And I'm like, yes. And he's like, that's all I needed to hear. And when we do meet, because we end up meeting in person, he's like, I had to do a deal. He wasn't supposed to live. He was going to die. And I had to do a deal with, he calls it the dark forces. Someone else might have said I did a deal with the devil mm -hmm. to salvage him. My side of the deal is ritualistic drinking. So I have to know... Did this actually have an effect on your dad? I mean, was there a coincidence where something actually went well for your dad because of this? Yeah, I mean, um, my my dad was, I don't think it had anything to do with Arun. Um, right. But when when my dad returned to New York, because um, I worked with, with him and with the business, he returned with his business associate. They both got back. My dad was very quiet about what happened there. So it's not like I got a story or anything. It's just one of these things we brush under the carpet and you know, mention secrecy and so on. So what Arun said to me is he said, ask your dad. I was with him in spirit. He would have felt me. I did not leave him for a minute while he was in prison. And 
whether he knew I would never say that to my dad, I did not ask my dad. I think if I had asked my dad, my dad would have been would have not said that that had happened. It just seemed like a weird thing to ask yeah. because I knew my dad didn't believe in everything that Arun uh, peddled. I call sure. it peddled. <laughs> you know, all the spiritual stuff. My dad didn't believe in it, so I wasn't going to mix up the narratives. Like yeah. it's weird how you almost keep different sides of your. But I wonder if how manipulators work is. Let's say it had dragged on. I think it was a calculated guess. But as it paid off and as my dad was released, then he could claim the glory for it. Mm -hmm. And I think, did I believe that he saved my dad's life? I felt like he had played a role. I cannot tell you hand on heart, Shalise, that I believe that he single handedly got my I No, 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 no. Right. There, were, there were legal forces. <laughs> you know, there were the normal channels of sorting out you know, a terrible situation yeah. they, that were not spiritual based. But he plants these seeds in your mind that you need me. Mm -hmm. And you're going to have to put up with the shit that I'm going to do. Sorry, <laughs> no, I'll say it on your episode. That's okay. You <laughs> you're going to have to put up with whatever. <laughs> you're, you know, you're going to have to put up with whatever I then need to be doing because I've got this controlling role in your life. Yeah. Yeah, there was a point maybe where that, um, you know, could have been a, we had a terrible hit <laughs> during my MBA, but I almost feel like when you're in a situation like this, at least for me, there's two parts of you. I think there's a part of you that is still functioning normally. And I know there's no such thing as normal, but functioning reasonably. You mm -hmm. know, I got to classes. I, you know, studied with great difficulty when he was around. I'd always been a great student. I was a terrible student with him around, but he went to India. He had these regular trips to India. While he was in India, my grades improved. I could actually focus again. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, looking back, it was very clear that there was a terrible energy. It, you know, I can use that word. I don't mind using that word that he was creating around him. There was a vortex of, 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 of like uh, restlessness and, and, and just all these machinations. I mean, these are not good things and they were definitely impacting me. But when he wasn't around, I, like I felt myself again, mm -hmm. um, but I still, I was hooked. Like I didn't want to be without him. I was very eager for him to return, but I just thought we've gone through this terrible stretch. We were fighting. Um, we were, I was no longer, you know, able to really enjoy sex with him because he was so um, out of control <laughs> and he became very belligerent. Like he was like, you're not enjoying it. What's wrong with you? Like, Ooh. this is like, he became really like argumentative. And I was like, oh. and obviously things went from bad to worse. And but I kind of dug my heels in and I was living this other life where no, like I'm on the MBA. When I finished the MBA, he said, right, you're done your MBA. Well done. I'm never working again. I'm retired. I mean, not that he'd worked in all this time, like he'd just taken money off of me the whole time. Um, but I was like, wait a minute, you're 50. How old was he then? He was like, I, for me, he was still a relatively young 58 year old. I'm yeah. like, wow, like you're never going to teach yoga again. Like you're never, you know, to me, that was his job. And he was like, oh, maybe if a student comes. But it was his way of saying, like, I'm living off of you now. <laughs> Interesting, because he did end up draining $50,000 of your money. Yeah, he did um, up to before the MBA. Yeah, mm -hmm. whatever I had, we lived off of it. You know, he always had a need. He borrowed. Some of it was borrowed, and he kind of swore to, on Baba to return it. <laughs> it's just, it's, they'll say absolutely anything. They'll swear on anything. And, you know, so, yeah, he did drain a lot of money. And then when I started working and got a corporate job, uh, that's why I say there were definitely two parallel, like the people in my corporate job who have known me for years and read this memoir, they're like, they're shocked, Shalice. They just, um, I don't think they even can understand that someone can live a double life. Yeah. Which is, I lived, my home life was a cocoon of this madness, if we can call it that, under the guise of spirituality. And my work life, um, I did tell people, you know, I told people about yoga told people about, you know, I didn't hide that I was very devoted to yoga and meditation and that my husband was a yogi and I introduced him to people and some people got wrapped up into him. I remember my last um, 
you know, role in the UK early on before we moved and settled in Paris, I was quite close to an HR director, friendly wise, and she met Arun and she knew who he was. And thanks to her, I'm like, look, we got to move to Paris. He's feeling suicidal in the UK. I didn't use that word, but he was saying, I'm going to die if we stay here. It was very intense but it got worse. (laughs) Yeah, it did get worse. And oh my goodness, and we don't have a ton of time, but I still want to hear about, because I read it in your book, I want to hear more from you about how he was using these channelings, or we'll put that in air quotes, to manipulate you and essentially do what he wanted with other people. Yeah, I mean, at some point, so we just, so I will say one thing, um, as I just said, I believed in the yoga, I believed, I believed in the spirituality, and I was bent upon uh, us making it our mission, and our work and, and our life. So we ended up opening a yoga center that that existed for 10 years, very well known in central Paris, as I told you, Shalise, we ended up, he ended up training other people who would then open their own yoga centers in this Agni yoga method. We opened it at great cost because there was the cost of the commercial lease, you know, very close to the Champs-Élysées, like a very nice area, you know, very um, prestigious area of Paris. He was set upon that we needed to be in the top area of Paris, probably thought that's where I can get the most lucrative, Mm -hmm. you know, catches. So there's always a plan. And then, so yes, we'd opened up, we'd had to do pretty big renovations to the space. So $100,000, you know, to set up this business. And I'm going, this is it, we've arrived. And the very first yoga class, not taught by him, but by this young male protege, who's in the book called Gabriel, I'm, I'm at peace. I'm like, oh, we've had the most horrible, whatever it was, six, seven years. It's been terrible, but it's all over now. We've got our yoga center. And I felt like I was realizing my mission. And then about, oh, a couple weeks later, this young student comes in, introduced through Gabriel, called Angela. And within several weeks, he, first he tries to connect her to me. He tries to say, you know, we're best, you know, you need to teach her the yoga. You need to teach her. And that doesn't go so well. I feel very weird teaching the yoga. As I'm trying to teach her, I'm like, how did he make this seem so smooth when he's (laughs) teaching me? I I felt very self-conscious. And then he said, okay, well, since you, you know, it's not working out in this formal teaching, why don't you go sleep at her place once a week? So that's how it starts. He was probably saying, how close can these two get? But after a while, you know, it was a friendship. There was nothing to it. I didn't like the idea of leaving my husband once a week, but he said it was a good idea. And then after that, he used the channeling to rope her into a relationship with the spirit on the basis of the fact that they'd been married before. And this was the spirit of Tao. And I knew at that point that things had broken irreparably. I didn't know how to extricate myself yet. I had a massive investment in the school. Angela was a part of the school game. You know, we had a setup and... I thought, oh, well, let me see how this goes. Like, is he going to, is she going to leave? Is he going to leave? I waited every day, every week for it to end. Yeah, but I knew something had died. (laughs) I thought it was me that had died uh, when it happened, metaphorically, but it felt like a death. It was a certain kind of death. And then Mm. that's how, there's no other, I can't think of another word for that feeling of violation, that feeling of abandonment and of, and of tremendous shame. You know, I felt such shame. I felt like I was, I felt like my identity had been erased and then, yeah, but the story doesn't end on that, on that note. Thankfully I, I do awaken from the nightmare. Oh, yeah, I definitely want to get to that point just to clarify, because it took me a second when I was reading the book to make sure I understood what was going on. So he openly told you in so many words, because he's channeling this spirit named Tao, who said, I was married to her in a past life. And so I'm going to be with her now. But it's not technically a rune who's with her in this sexual relationship, it's Tao. So he is not really culpable. It's not his fault because it's not him doing it. Is that right? That's exactly right. And he had said to me years earlier that Tao was my brother in a past life. So he's established a blood relationship. And you know how I said that Tao was much nicer than Arun? Uh Tao was creating a relationship with me as well. So one of the versions of Arun's personalities, one of his personas was being like, 
don't worry, Arun's a bit of a basket case, or he's a bit crazy. He's always been crazy, because obviously they've known each other in a past life, too. Uh So he's telling me he's a little crazy, but you can trust me. I'm your brother. I've got your back. Oh, the level of manipulation. It's so much, Joelle. It's so leveled and layered and thick and dense with all of these things that he has just planted and planted and they all play off of each other. I don't know how he kept it all straight, to be honest with you. It seems like a lot of work over all of these years. And then to blatantly just be like, yeah, I'm going to go cheat on you and you have to be okay with it because of all this groundwork that he's already laid it's just mind blowing. And so obviously you felt betrayed and obviously you weren't okay with it, even if you were, were at the time going along with the story. But what was it that finally broke you and made you realize I have to get out of here? Again, it it unraveled step by step. The first moment when I call, I call it regaining my power was when I nearly lost my job. So I'd been steady at this company. I'd moved through up through the ranks. I was earning a very good salary. And then the company declared chapter 11. And I suddenly had like an illumination moment where I was like, oh my goodness, when and if, if and when I lose my job, we have nothing. Our French residencies depend on this job Mm -hmm. because they were tied to my employment. We are indebted in different places because he put me into debt so that he could build property in India that was supposedly for us, but that was clearly only for him and his family there. We, we, you know, we were indebted. Uh, We, we had Angela who was, you know, an employee, but I mean, there was just so many levels of financial obligation that I had Mm -hmm. that all of a sudden I said, but this guy hasn't been doing a thing for the last eight years. And I thought it's all down to me. I said, yeah, he encouraged me to get the MBA. Good on him. Like in my mind, you know, my like, (laughs) still, I hadn't like discredited him. I'm like, okay, good. He got me. But since then he's done nothing to bring money into the household. And all of a sudden I realized it's, I had this feeling, this really powerful feeling of my own uh, worth and what I'd actually contributed because up to then I didn't really value myself. Mm -hmm. I think the reason that I was able to accept a lot of what Arun did is I did not have the self-esteem and the belief in myself that I actually had value and worth all by myself and that yeah. I didn't need him. From that moment, Shalise, until the actual leaving him was about a couple of years. But what happened was that in that time, when I did get a job at the 11th hour in a company that acquired our business unit, I just said, oh, my goodness, God, life, destiny, whatever you want to call it, I got a second chance. I am not going to blow it. So I made a 180 degree shift in my behavior. I said, no more of this yoga and spirituality stuff. I need to perform in this new company because they might fire me. So I went in there. I went in there with a smile. And, you know, all of a sudden my new colleagues like me. And this is somewhere something I heard on one of your other episodes. All of a sudden I'm getting along with people that are not in the yoga world. And yeah. I think this is a good place to end because in my mind, if you didn't do yoga and spirituality, eh, you didn't really cut it. Yeah. You were one of the uninitiated. It, it's a terrible hierarchy and you still hear some of that arrogance. Oh, well, you need to do your yoga and your spirituality to be in the right place. So I had never, I had not made a single friend outside of that circle in many years. Now I get to this new company with a smile and people are nice and I'm meeting colleagues that I'm getting along with and I'm like, wait a second, there's a world out there. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And it really, and so step by step, Arun was very careful in the game he played. I think if I had said, no way, Tao and Angela, I think he would have dumped her. Like, I think it might have been somebody else somewhere else. He could not risk the financial flow that he was getting from me. Mm-hmm. Now, maybe he would dump me too. I mean, I don't know. We would have dumped, but what I'm trying to say is, None of these things were really absolutes because there's many conversations that we're having in the book where I'm like, I don't know if I can handle it. Like, or I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I'm trying to be like, well, she's going to, you know, she's going to leave us. Why would she want to be this third wheel? Like we're a marriage. What she has no standing. She can never go out with her boyfriend. So I was trying to try to talk reason. I was talking like you talk to a reasonable person. So that's why I think it lasted that long, because he was like the push pull at every step. I'll I'll tell you the one thing. When I finally said I'm leaving the bedroom, like I am, this is over, we're separating. He didn't put up a very strong fight. He started to whine. (laughs) He became a whiner. (laughs) 
Oh, wow. <laughs> the, the true persona comes out when you realize he's not as strong as you thought he was. <laughs> this is it. And what it took, I mean, we were, we had stopped, you know, our sexual relationship had stopped for some time, but we were still sleeping in the same room. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I said, and so one day I was like, um, I'm, I'm not, you know, this is over essentially, or I didn't say this is over, but I said, I'm, I'm moving into the living room and he didn't like that, but he let it pass. And then a couple of seconds, when are you coming back to the bedroom? So he cajoled. And that's when I was like, I'm never like, I'm leaving you. And he just looked at me and he's like, Oh, I'll go back to India then. Oh, I was like, yeah, if you want to. Oh man, that hurt my heart. Did that hurt your heart at all that he didn't put up a fight? Did you feel like Oh, that he never really had those feelings that came later so that came later and i'll tell you why that again was still manipulation because i was over him by then yeah. i mean i had met trevor so i i had emotionally disconnected yeah but i hadn't seen through the con yet i was a little surprised i mean i was more at that point i was my reason had kicked in Julie. so i was like oh that's, but he he didn't he he put up a fight in different ways he stopped being arrogant but he kept like asking for money from india and then he actually did try to come back and showed up at my door unexpectedly like in the year we were a month before our scheduled divorce date mm. so when he left that 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 time in november i did you know within a month i contacted a divorce lawyer we put all the because we were like very interconnected financially. I mean, there, you know, there were a lot of things to un unpack. Yeah. And so he showed up at my door, maybe the last time. And I just had to close, like I looked at his face and I could feel myself getting right drawn back into him because he mm -hmm. put on this, like this, like baby face almost like this. like, huh? And I'm like, Oh, no. I knew by then mentally. So I just lost. And he said, like, can I at least use the bathroom? I'm like, no. I mean, he's a much bigger guy than I am. I'm like, if he comes in and uses the bathroom, I may never get him out again. But I was so stupid. I still feel guilty for saying that. But after the divorce, when there was no more money, as long as he thought he could get even, I'm exaggerating if I say even $10, but some money from me, he kept the contact. But after the divorce, much to his dismay, we end up doing a settlement around some of these properties that he built. But he wanted cash. Like, he wanted me to keep the properties and cash. And I'm like, you're not getting Anyway, we, we went back and forth. There's an argument in the book and so on. And then after that, no more phone calls. And that's when I knew. So not when mm. that's when I knew. I'm like, and so I voiced it. I had to voice it. I had to voice it to someone. So one evening, about a month after my divorce, I say to Trevor, do you think he ever loved me? And when I, and when I heard myself, I, I just, I thought, oh my goodness. And I started to cry. And I think Trevor was crying on the line because that's when, and he's like, I didn't know when I would tell you. I didn't know when we would ever talk about it. You've been had for 18 years. How compassionate of him to not have put you in the position to have that conversation before you were ready. That's, Really admirable. Thanks, Trevor. Now we can talk about you, Trevor. <laughs> um, that's amazing. And I'm so happy that you have him and you have that support because I'm sure things still come up. Yeah, no, they did. I had um, night terrors. I, I, it, I put them, they do come up. When I started to then have the night terrors, it was, it, I felt like someone was trying to suck the life out of me. Mm. It was a very, those first night terrors, I could see him. And it was always me trying to run away and him just, just like, like embrace, like holding me back. Mm -hmm. And then I'd wake up completely screaming, like drenched in sweat. Like I really felt like I, I think the way my brain reinterpreted what had happened or whether someone else would say that he really was dabbling with like very negative stuff, mm -hmm. whatever is your interpretation in those first dreams, it felt like a life and death situation which I'd never picked up when I lived with him. Yeah. I was so under his control that I never felt fear. I think people, my mom felt fear on my behalf. She said to me after I told her I was getting divorced, she said to me, I didn't know, A, I didn't think I would ever live to hear those words. She says, you were unreachable. And B, I thought he was going to kill you. Oh my gosh. But what she then reasoned to herself, she said, is he wouldn't kill his golden goose. Mm -hmm. But 
on a metaphorical spiritual level or whatever he was absolutely sapping my energy milking me dry and i think he was planning you know and i i think he was doing something similar to angela whether he was grooming her and other young women you know get invested in their future and one day when they then develop financially you get money off of them as well so you asked was it money was it sex it was kind of all wrapped into one yeah and that's kind of the definition of a cult leader they want money power and sex and it seems like that's what he was after and that's what he eventually ended up getting until you put a stop to it so i'm sure everyone's probably wondering what happened to him yeah well i mean i didn't we lost touch um although two years later he um wrote me this very strange facebook message two years after we lost touch he said why are you doing this to me when i left my family for you <gasps> No way! Joel, did he admit then, kind of in a roundabout way, that he wasn't the spirit who took over? He actually was like, I left my family for you? He actually wrote that. Yeah. Wow. yeah. And by then I had gathered as much. You yeah. Know? I mean, obviously I had. You put so, it together. And then a year after that, so the friend, yeah, the friend that he actually... Um, that we traveled with way back then before we were involved, Surat, that friend remained a constant. They remained friends. And I also, you know, by association with Rune, he called me a year after that. So that's, you know, maybe eight years ago or so, maybe a little bit less, seven years ago, and, and said um, he tried to call me and I didn't pick up the phone. And then he immediately texts me and he says, Harunji died. So then I call back right away. And I still want to, you know, it's, it's my past. It's my youth. So I say to him, what happened? And he said, infection. Surat doesn't have a lot of English. I mean, he just, and I said, I asked him, I said, were you still friends at the end? You know, he said yes or whatever. And that's, yeah. So that's where the story ends. Hmm. Well, I'm glad he's not a threat anymore. Did that affect you at all? Was it a relief? Were you sad? Mm, I was I felt sorry for my younger self. I, it was a relief. Mm -hmm. I had been afraid of him, even if it was there was no threat to him finding out where I lived. Um, I think when I left, some people have asked me, like, "Do you hate him? Are you angry?" And those were my those were not my dominant emotions. I mean, my dominant emotions were when I first mm -hmm. left him were relief and fear, because I thought, "Oh my gosh, if I've been conned this well." You know, it, it took a while to, as you say, you gain your power, but you've got to really instill it. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, it was fear. But yeah, when I found out he was, he had died, it was a relief. But I also sort of remembered my 22 year old self in that moment. And I felt sorry for her. And I, you know, I realized where it had all began, begun and um and since yeah. then, I know we're out of time, but since then, you know, these stories, as unique as this particular scenario is, in terms of, as you said, the ma the crazy, brilliant mastermind, the sick mastermind, or whatever you them, there are, you know, recently in France, uh, when I say recently, I think it was the end of November, there was a huge police operation involving hundreds of French policemen who went to the outskirts of Paris and arrested a tantric guru. It's in the news. And he, he was holding 26 women and people use air quotes. I don't know if it's air quotes captive. And he was accused of sexual trafficking. And it, it, it I'm like, wow, that's that's another version of a rune. And he was saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. Authentic Him Himalayan yoga, the yoga of Tantra, you know, an element of it. So. So, yes, there are other. We see this scenario um, more often than we'd like in these circles. Yeah, and that's a reason why we wanted to speak to you today as well, is even though this person, Arun, is not a threat anymore, we do want to speak to things that are probably still going on and just maybe plant a seed in people's mind if they know of anything like this happening. We are interested in interviewing a couple more people on this topic, those who have been sucked in by a guru or a fake guru, someone who claimed to be something that they're not and are exploiting people and abusing people. So thank you so much for coming on and sharing. I guess I still want to know, though, how you're doing now. I know you're married to Trevor, but what's your consciousness side? What makes you happy and at peace? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm doing much better. 
I, um, when I moved to the UK, so I moved to the UK, I changed countries and I returned to my faith system. I did return to a Judeo Christian foundation of morality. I felt like I need a moral basis <laughs> to how I live and to how I interpret the world. And that was important to me. And now I'm much more aware of, you know, how I'm going to call it evil uh, does lurk. And, it, you know, it, it's important to uh, take a stand. I think I felt like I hadn't taken a stand. And now, you know, I I'm much more confident of what I believe and seeing that there are charlatans out there. But no, I'm, I'm, I'm much better. And I think telling my story and publishing it has given me my voice back. I did not know how much I had lost my confidence and my voice uh, since mm -hmm. I started spiritual practices. I felt like I didn't matter. All that mattered was the spirituality. But actually, you can't just have the spirituality. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm so glad that we had this conversation. It was so great to hear your story and to dive into something that we haven't really talked about yet, which is the dark side of spirituality. And so I really appreciate you coming on and sharing. Everyone, go check out her book, The Secret Practice, 18 Years on the Dark Side of Yoga. We will put a link in the description. Yes, it's right behind her. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there it is. If you want to follow her on Instagram, we'll also put the links in the description, Joelle Tamraz. And is there anything else that you want to promote or speak on before we go? No, I mean, my website is joelletamraz.com. And yeah, now I'm full-time writer and speaker. So I'm very happy with that, that personal development. That's amazing. I love that. So we need your Linda Listen moment, your sassy statement as the viral video with the toddler goes or something inspirational. Yeah, for me, I would just say to everyone, do not give your power to another human being. Uh, the gurus don't hold the power. You give them the power. Make sure you hold on to your own power and own it. That is so good. Oh, I love that point. The gurus don't have power. You give them power. That in itself is very powerful. <laughs> <laughs> thank well, you. thank you again. This has been great. Do you have any final thoughts before we go? No, Shalise, I just want to thank you. This has been great. I've really enjoyed, you know, getting to know you and the work you do. And thank you for the opportunity to speak and share about my experience with you and your listeners. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Well, it's been wonderful chatting with you. And guys, if you're listening, make sure to leave those words of encouragement down below in the comments section. I love how kind everyone is and respectful of our guests. It does mean a lot to us. And if you want to support the podcast even further, you can get some of our merch at cultsofconsciousness.com. We have little baby onesies now <laughs> for baby Rhea, who will make an appearance in a few weeks, hopefully, fingers crossed. Um, and we are going to Costa Rica, which is going be fun if you want to do something less culty and more adventurous and exciting and get to know us and we would love to get to know you and our patrons we have some new patrons you can find that at patreon.com slash cults to consciousness paul iron Lindsay, and sarah thank you so much for your contributions and if you like this video i will link two more down here below that you can check out and until next time follow your highest excitement be conscious and be well <laughs>